about um, two weeks ago, I joined um, what was humorously referred to as Sayadaw Tours, which was a group led by, very informally led by Joseph and Jack. We met quite accidentally in Bangkok and we went north to, we visited two monasteries and I had a chance to meet two of the teachers who had a very profound effect on Jack's training. One of whom was Achen Cha. We also visited a um, monastery, perhaps the first of its kind, which is under the abbotship of a Westerner with Westerners as the bhikkhus or sadhus, monks. Very much like Black Elk, I am always faced with that predicament that he had about his visions of seeing more than you can say and knowing more than you saw. For it's hard to describe how, what subtle effects seeing people living such disciplined monastic lives can have on you. And seeing in the older students and in the abbots and the senior monks such perfect equanimity and such inner strength. In both of the abbots, the other thing that was very obvious was that the method of uh, Vipassana had taken them beyond their method and that these men were both men of joy, of great love, and that they awakened in the monks much reverence and love. In fact, the scenes were considerably more bhakti more devotionally warm in this subtle way. than I am used to in connections with monastery. For we very rarely see the products of Vipassana at such an evolved level where the forms start to disappear. And both of these abbots in their remarks to us, which were exquisitely translated by Jack, who is very subtle in his understanding of uh, the Thai and Laotian languages, we were in effect allowed to see that balance it exists in such beings between freedom, play, and love on the one hand and perfect commitment to lineage on the other. In fact, I think we were privileged to see something that most of the monks are not allowed to see in the stage they're at. For some of the monks that were present later came up to us and thanked us for coming because they said it allowed them to see a whole different aspect of their teacher. For to them, he shows lineage, the face of lineage, and merely demands the severest discipline 
he upbraided them severely for not wearing their robes properly on a very hot day in view of the fact that guests were present. And yet to us, I never felt that there was any judgment or imposition of the forms. But I felt more fully than I think I've felt before the basic tenets that Buddha taught. There was nothing these men said, and I could feel it as he, they were saying it, that I don't say. I didn't hear any of their material that wasn't familiar. But the place from which they said it, the depth of the appreciation of the nature of suffering, the cause of suffering, the way to end suffering, the depth of the panya of their appreciation of anicca, dukkha, anatta. The power that comes from the beings because of the depth of their samadhi and the fact that these beings live with over 200 precepts of shila, of purification. And many of them have been doing so for 40 years. It is clear that they don't, the senior monks don't follow shila, purification. The, what they have, quote, given up out of any sense of hardship. Their one meal a day is very sufficient. The silence in their life is enough. It was the first time I was ever at a forest monastery, a true forest monastery. Each of the cells is a, a room, maybe eight feet square, set up in stilts, isolated from all the others by many trees, high enough up so that on hot days they could sit underneath it, all made of thatch, weaving, the nuns live separate from the monks. No monk can go to the nun's side without some duena, somebody to go along with him. When I went to offer something to the Western nun that was there, she couldn't take it from my hand. I had to place it on the ground and she would pick it up. I went with the, we all went with the young Western monks on their begging rounds, carrying their huge begging bowls, some of them five miles, going out at 4.30 in the morning, just the first light. Coming into villages, very poor villages, where the villagers kneel by the side of the road with these little wicker baskets full of what's called sticky rice, which is a form of rice they grow there, which is easy to grow than regular rice. It's a kind of a gelatinous mass. 
and they would reach in and grab a piece of rice and stick it into the bowl. The monks would not look to either side, they would just hold their bowls and this would be done and they just walked their rounds. Came back to the monastery and when they had all regathered, which was at around 10 in the morning, five hours for this process, the food was distributed among them. It was all turned over to the nuns who then prepared it, mixed it, distributed it, all the different things that had been brought in. And then it was eaten in silence with the eldest monk eating first. One could feel the yearning inside all of us, I think, for this kind of simple, deep, quiet, dharmic existence. The Western abbots said, we're fulfilling a role within the community. They don't have a feeling, the younger monks do have the feeling that they're in as an experiment and that they will probably leave after some time. The older monks don't. For them, it is their way of life. And you can feel in that culture the balance of that way of life so that their existence, as these brown-robed monks walk through the villages, you can see that it gives meaning to the villagers' lives. And their offering of food is their merit or their sadhana, their offering. And the existence of these monasteries all over, to, all over Thailand is feeding the community in a very beautifully balanced way. It's keeping the spirit. In fact, these men and women are dedicating their lives to the spirit. Is feeding the entire community. The monastery I was, we were visited is not many miles from the border. Across the border, the monasteries have been totally destroyed by the communist guerrillas in very vicious ways with the abbots usually having their bellies slit with knives and their intestines taken out and shown to them to show them what they have been feeding at the expense of the people. And yet I didn't get a flicker of a vibration of fear in the monks, even though much of this might be inevitable for them as well. I think that journey brought Jack and Joseph and I, and in fact, the whole group that was there, Jamie was there from class in New York, and Kathy and Alan. Steve Smith and Chandra and all that. What it seemed to do was um, bring us all closer together and free us of a lot of the tensions that exist between whose method is which. And it felt very much like it was inevitable that sooner or later we would all grow beyond all of our forms and labels. Because I, as a bhakti, who now know what my way is very clearly from what happened to me, from what I've learned this year, and know that my way is my love of my guru, and my loving of all things and beings, and my understanding of all experiences of my life is a dialogue with my guru. While I'm secure in that as my method, and know that my basic method is not Vipassana, yet I have no difficulty at all in next week going down to San Diego to take a course with Jack and Joseph. And Joseph and Jack, I think, also, we all felt, especially with Achen Cha, who has a big belly and a very warm, loving way, that there were just shades of Maharaji. 
and that we all saw a very deep devotional and loving and bhakti quality of this tradition at its highest level. It's very delicate For example, I recall Trungpa Rinpoche saying he would give up everything but his lineage. And I could feel the restraints on these beings to stay within their forms. And in this way, Buddhism is different than the concept of guru in Hinduism. Because in Buddhism, in the Kalyan Metta, the spiritual friend that the teacher is, or the tulkus in Mahayana Buddhism, they carry the precious jewel which is the lineage and it's passed from person to person and nobody, what they are offering you is the jewel of the method, the practices. The Hindu guru concept is the merging of one being into another. The jewel is the being. In Achin Cha's case, the jewel and the being are one, but the form is still the transmitter of the jewel. Maharaji, my guru, had no form that he transmitted. He kept undercutting forms. All there was, was the nature of being. Part of my error in the past was demanding that every teacher be Maharaji and not make this distinction but it's a very real distinction. My difficulty is that the only jewel, because of the lineage which is passed in the case of Maharaji, from being into being, all I can do is love and be loved and love and be loved until that flow occurs. There's no form for it. It's all forms of daily life. And somewhere between that and these very exquisite forms lies the path we are pursuing. And as Joseph and Jack and I explored and Steve explored the process of setting up a monastic setting that would be more evolved than Barry, the Insight Meditation Society, the big monastery which is, offers these courses. <coughs> Questions were, what kind of Sheila, what kind of purification would you demand? What are we ready for? What kind of discipline are we ready for? Are we transporting Theravadan Buddhism to America? Or are we taking the practices and molding them to our own what? To our own attachments? Or to our own peculiar karmic needs? Very subtle issues.
Each year gets more interesting and more profound for all of us. Sometimes the year is a year of the most intense training. Sometimes the year is a year of floundering and depression and despair. But all of us here must realize by now how much all of it is the process. Because we have enough mindfulness to be able to grow through all of it. It's only when you lose mindfulness completely that the material is just karma running you instead of you working through karma. And maybe more of us are arriving at a stage now where we aren't desperately grabbing at this and that for fear we aren't enough. But we're just staying open to how the cards are being dealt and responding to the yearning for discipline when it is there and allowing the flow or even lack of discipline when that yearning is absent. I think maybe at this point we're ready to to mindfully attend to our guilt rather than buying in on it every time it arises. This was a hard year for me and one of the most beautiful and high years I ever can recall. Feels like they're getting better and worse all at once. (laughs) It's the It's the joy, not the pleasure. I was in a world in Bali of pleasure seekers. But what I experienced was bliss. But the bliss which includes the pleasure and the pain. Because when you seek pleasure, you seek to avoid pain. But when you stay mindful and keep releasing yourself from the attachments to your desires, you begin to know bliss and joy. <laughs>